Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 12, and then 22 through 25. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the disciples said to Jesus, where do you want, to, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover meal? While they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, take, this is my body. He took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I assure you that I won't drink wine again until the day when I drink it in a new way in God's kingdom. Adam Hamilton begins his book by remarking that we believe Jesus' life lasted around 33 years, and if you multiply that out, that represents 12,000 days. And if you look at the Gospels, you'll find they concentrate most of the material on the last 1,100 days of his life, or three years. And then you discover, as you look at the material dedicated to the last 24 hours of his life, that that is where they concentrate and see as the climax of each of their books. In those 24 hours, which began after dusk on Thursday night, Jesus will eat his last supper with the disciples. He'll pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. He'll be betrayed and deserted by his friends. He'll then be tried by the religious authorities for blasphemy. He'll then be taken to Pontius Pilate, where he'll be tried and sentenced for insurrection. Then he'll be beaten, tortured by Roman soldiers, and then undergo his death and burial, all in 24 hours. I hope as we go through this series and we rehearse for you the details that you'll find deeper meaning for your spiritual journey, and I also hope that that historical context will help bring some relevance for these events to your personal life. I think it's important to note that Jesus seemed to have chosen the path that would lead to his death. We have a section in the 11th chapter of John where Jesus says that they need to go to Judea to go tend to his friend Lazarus. And we have a remark by the disciple Thomas that seems to have a sarcastic tone that says, let us go to, with him so that we may die also. You see, they knew that that is where in Jerusalem was where all the political turmoil they had experienced before, and they knew that things were coming to a climax. And there Jesus would find trouble once again. And trouble he did find. Very quickly, once entering the city, he was in controversy and, and arguing with the religious authorities. He would then go into the temple and see how people were taken advantage of, and he'd overturn the tables of the money changers, which made even more enemies. And in that experience, we would see that things were coming to a head. He would know very clearly that when he sent his disciples, Peter and John, into the city to make arrangements for the Last Supper, that this would be his last meal on earth, the last meal that he would share with those disciples. He gave them some rather strange instructions. He told them to go into town and look for a man carrying a jar of water. And you wonder, what significance would that have? But you need to understand that in those days, carrying a jar of water was a woman's job. And so seeing a man doing so would stand out even in the midst of the busy streets in Jerusalem. This room is the traditional site of the upper room. Now, this can't be the actual room because we know that Jerusalem was completely destroyed in 70 AD, but this room is on the traditional site where that evening would have occurred. It's likely also the room, that site, where the Pentecost experience took place, where 120 disciples gathered and experienced the flames, the tongues of fire, representing the Holy Spirit. About 3 o'clock, Peter and John would have taken the lamb that he had secured and they would have gone to the temple. And there that lamb would be sacrificed, its throat would be slit, the blood would be poured at the base of the altar. 
all while thousands of other pilgrims are singing psalms. Another priest would then butcher that lamb, and the lamb would be taken back to the place where they would celebrate the meal, where it would be roasted in wine and oil for three to four hours. The disciples then would gather about seven o'clock. And as they gathered at that time, they would be rehearsing the Passover Seder meal. Now, the Passover Seder meal was a meal to commemorate an event that happened thousands of years before. Remember, the Israelites were slaves for some 400 years. And as they rehearsed that meal, they recalled the events that happened at that time. You see, God had seen his people in slavery, and he commanded Moses to go to Pharaoh and demand that they be set free. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and so a series of plagues came and went. They still didn't break the will of Pharaoh until one final plague came, an angel of death. And the Israelites were instructed to take a lamb, to sacrifice it, and take the blood and mark the doorpost over the doorway. And when that angel of death would come, it would pass over their homes and visit the homes that had not taken those preparations. And as history records, those events did take place. That angel of death visited the homes of the humble in Egypt as well as the palace of Pharaoh. And his will was broken and he commanded them to, to leave Egypt. And so they left. And they left taking their bread that was the unleavened bread with them. And so to this day, every year, that meal is commemorated and it's called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. To recall that they left in such a haste. Now, that evening meal has been rehearsed every year thereafter. And it's full of symbolism, and the foods that they share, among others, represent so much. They eat bitter herbs, sometimes horseradish or parsley. And those herbs are dipped in water, salt water, to represent their tears. Together, they represent the bitterness that they experienced as slaves in Egypt. They also dipped their bread in hereset, a mixture of apples and nuts, to recall the mortar that was used to build the buildings that Pharaoh demanded they build. They'd also share an egg to represent the new life that God would give them once they left Egypt. And then they would share in the lamb once again, a lamb that they would take back and eat together as their last meal their last meal in Egypt. And then, of course, the matzah, or the unleavened bread that recalled the haste in which they had to leave. All those foods represented an act that's so very important. And it's vital for us to understand as we recall that same event because Jesus turned that Passover Seder meal into a meal of remembrance for us that we continue to celebrate through the act of Holy Communion. But I want us to understand something that I think is gained from this Passover Seder meal. Because I imagine most of us, when we celebrate Holy Communion, as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we, we probably recall forgiveness as the primary purpose of this act. But on this night, it is not about forgiveness. It's about deliverance. You see, the Israelites had another festival. They called Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, in which another lamb was slaughtered and the blood poured out to recall forgiveness for the whole nation of Israel. On this night, the focus is on deliverance. It celebrates that God has set them free to a new life and a new understanding. I think that's vital for us as we continue to recall that Seder meal. To realize that, yes, it involves forgiveness, but it's more than forgiveness. It's deliverance. It's deliverance to a new life that Jesus gave of his life that we might have life and be set free by it. I'd like to thank the worship arts team that helped put this scene together. Because I imagine when we recall the Last Supper scene, probably most of us think of a painting, a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. And I want you to know... Leonardo got it wrong in many ways. For one thing, you notice there's daylight coming through the windows. 
Well, we're pretty sure the meal was in the evening after dusk. Also, the table, which you see is one long table, while it would be true that they would be on one side of the table, more likely the typical Jewish feast would be set up in a horseshoe fashion. And the servants would use this middle portion to serve those in that meal. It was called the triplenium. Tri meaning three, and plenium meaning to recline, triplenium. And so it was more typical. Here, Dick, make yourself useful. Thank you. <laughs> to eat the meal reclining. Remember, wood is a scarce resource in the Holy Land. And so they would eat the meal reclining. They would always eat with their right hand, and so they would always lean on the left because the left hand was considered unclean, which frustrates me being a left-hander. But they would dip the foods and eat thus. Now, it's important to realize that, that Leonardo also got it wrong in placing Jesus at the center of the table. The places of honor were at the left side of the triclinium. And here the honored guest would sit, and then to his immediate right and to his immediate left would be the places of honor. Also, a couple more details that are interesting. You recall a couple times in the scriptures, it says that Jesus, while he was eating a meal, had his feet washed by one woman with tears, and another anointed his feet with oil. And that would be because he is leaning. The most appropriate place for a woman to touch someone would be his feet. To get any closer would be inappropriate. And likely, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, they would have turned thus and would have washed them in that fashion. Now, here's the important thing to grasp. It's significant as you read those last supper events that remember when Jesus says, someone is about to betray me? And Peter who my guess is probably was sitting over there or leaning over there, whispers to John, the beloved disciple, who is it? And it says that John leaned on Jesus. He probably reclined, leaned forward, and asked Jesus, who is it? And what does Jesus say? He says, it is the one with whom I will dip this morsel. That means the most likely spot for Judas to be would be in the other place of honor. Or it'd have to be at least the next spot. So think about the significance of that event. Jesus knows that Judas is about to betray him. He also knows that Peter's about to deny him. And the rest of the disciples will desert him. How interesting that Jesus, on that last meal, would let those places of honor be shared by those who would betray him the most. Let me tell you why that means so much to me. Several years ago, when I was serving Aldersgate United Methodist Church on the southwest side of Indianapolis, I lived just three miles from my parents' house. And my parents were remodeling their kitchen. And so to do so, they were knocking out a wall from a bedroom and using that to make the kitchen larger. Now, I'm not much of a construction person, but I'm pretty good at knocking out a wall. So I took one of my children, my daughter Kelsey, with me to help take a little burden off my wife. And we went over to Grandpa and Grandma's, and I let Grandma watch her while I was beating that wall down. After two or three hours, it was time to go, and so I went and picked Kelsey up. I got her in her car seat in the back seat, and as I'm driving home, I look in the rearview mirror, and I notice that her head is bobbing, and her eyes are rolling up inside her head, and I realize something's not right. And then I recalled seeing my mother's pills, remember she's schizophrenic and she has some powerful medication, had been laying on the counter and I put two and two together very quickly and realized she'd gotten into my mother's medication. So I quickly stopped by home, picked up my wife, we ran to Methodist Hospital, we had her stomach pumped and we had the names of the medications and discovered that one of them has the power to slow down a heart and for a young child, depending on how much she got, could actually stop her heart. And so she was unconscious that whole night. I remember sitting in that emergency room and not knowing if my daughter was going to wake up. 
And I remember praying as fervently as I could, God, please. And it was a strange evening for me because I have to confess, I didn't feel God near at that moment. I didn't feel any comfort. I remember a chaplain coming by, walking right by me, and I wanted so bad just to say something, but I couldn't bring myself to it. I was hoping he'd initiate the conversation so we could go and talk and I could get some of this burden off. But he didn't, and so I didn't receive any help that night. I was in the ICU unit about 5 o'clock in the morning, and Kelsey opens her eyes, and she says, Hi. Sweetest words I have ever heard in my life. It turned out she was fine. It turned out that uh, she didn't ingest as much medication as we were afraid that she might have, and everything was fine. But you know, that next week, I began to reflect back, and I was bothered. I mean, how can I? I'm a minister of the gospel, and I was praying genuinely, why didn't I feel God at the moment I thought I needed him the most? And God gave me an answer very quickly. His answer was, I never left you, but you created the barrier. It was your guilt that got in the way that prevented God from being what I needed him to be at that moment. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I know in my ministry I've come across a lot of people in that situation where their own guilt because of the mistakes they have made or because someone has pounded in them because of their own dysfunctions that they're worthless. And that is creating a barrier between you and God. And if that's the case for you, I hope you remember that Jesus ate his last supper and perhaps gave the places of honor to the person who betrayed him, the people that would abandon him. And he still shared that meal with them. I hope you remember that every time we take communion and know that Jesus has not abandoned us either. You might find it interesting that during the years in which Christians were experiencing extreme persecution in the 2nd and 3rd century. That Lent became that traditional time in which anybody who had denied Christ because he wanted to save his own neck was allowed to repent and through penance could return to the fold of the church and be restored once again. So I hope that's what Holy Communion will be for you. Adam Hamilton recalls Rabbi Amy Katz and trying to share the significance of that Passover Seder, said that for every Jew who recreates that Seder meal, they enter the evening as a slave, and they leave the evening free. Well, I hope that'll be the case for you, especially if you have anything that's holding you back, anything that's keeping you from letting God deliver you to the life that he tends for you. We enter slaves. And every time we recall Christ's sacrifice, we can then be set free. It seemed only appropriate that we make communion available. So after the service, if you'd like to receive that sacrament, especially with that new meaning in your life, please go to the prayer chapel. And Pastor Otter and Pastor Yunker will be there to provide that for you. And I hope that you'll be restored, especially in this season of Lent, the time to know that God is the one who reaches out to us. He is the one who shared his last meal with those who would betray him. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you for your grace that gets lived out and seen in such concrete ways. We hope that if anyone here is wrestling with that in their life now, that they'll experience the deliverance that you intend for each one of us, that we be set free in every way, to live the life that Jesus has made possible, life abundant. This is our hope and our prayer in the name of Christ, who is our Lord. Amen.